The USA is delivering 80% of the funds, international funds going into Somalia. Where is the EU? Where is the UK? Where is the Gulf? They're nowhere. And that should be a source of real shame. Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast for the foreign policy and global development communities and anyone who wants a deeper understanding of what is driving events in the world today. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg. I am a veteran international affairs journalist and the editor of UN Dispatch. Enjoy the show. As 2023 begins, the world is beset by crises driven by conflict, climate change, and the nexus of the two. But some places are expected to be hit harder than others, and today's conversation with David Miliband offers listeners key insights into where humanitarian needs are expected to be most acute in 2023. David Miliband is the president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee, which at the very end of 2022 released a watch list of the global crises it foresees this year. We kick off with a brief discussion about the methodology of creating a crisis watch list like this before having an extended discussion about several of his top crises of concern. And we, of course, as I do often on this show, discuss solutions to confront humanitarian crises across the world. And a happy new year to listeners and a special thank you to listeners who have become premium subscribers to support the show. You can become a premium subscriber by going to patreon.com slash global dispatches, or if you're listening On Apple Podcasts, you can become a premium subscriber with just a few taps of your finger. And exciting news for the new year, we are launching a substack in which paying subscribers can get transcripts of the episodes delivered directly to your inbox nearly as soon as the episode is published. To sign up for those, please visit globaldispatches.substack.com. I thank you all for your continuing support in 2023. And now here is my conversation with David Miliband, President and CEO of the International Rescue Committee. Can you explain to listeners how you created this watch list? Can you explain a little bit the methodology? The watch list is a unique resource, really, because it combines quantitative with qualitative data. Quantitative data, 67 different data sources on more than 20 countries around the world. And that is then combined with the insights of our country teams, 200 field offices around the world. And it's out of that that we take figures and data and analysis of this year and then posit the 20 countries most likely to suffer humanitarian distress next year. And what's very striking is that if you look at this historically, 85 to 90% of the crises we've successfully highlighted, the last year we didn't manage to get Ukraine. We didn't think that the Russians would invade. You are not alone. We were not alone. But the record's pretty good. And that's important for two reasons. It's got an internal planning reason. We're a humanitarian aid agency. We need to pre-position people and goods so that we're ready. But we also increasingly feel that the humanitarian sector needs to do a much better job of speaking up about what's actually happening to the people that we serve, what the political decisions are that are undermining the position of the people that we serve and what can be done in our own sector to change the position of the people that we serve. So this is not just a descriptive document, it's also a call to action, and no doubt we'll get to talk about that as well in the course of this conversation. We certainly will. Could you just let listeners know, what are some of those data points that are inputted into this document to inform you what the key crises are in 2023? 
Yeah, we look at conflict data from organizations like ACLED. We look at climate data from organizations like the Notre Dame Institute of Climate Vulnerability. We look at data from the Georgetown Institute of Women's Peace and Security because we're very interested in gender inequality and violence against women. So we take these 67 credible independent data sources and crunch them and then subject them to some qualitative assessment from our teams. So the full list includes 10 crises to watch in 2023 that you feel will be particularly urgent. And I encourage listeners to read the full report. We're not going to go through all 10, but I would love to quickly run through the top five. Where are you most concerned as we head in 2023? Well, the data points us in a very clear direction. The top country is Somalia, the second top country is Ethiopia. So immediately our attention is directed towards the Horn of Africa. You then get to Afghanistan, Yemen, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. So you can immediately begin to see some of the geographical footprint. You're absolutely right to say there are 10 countries highlighted as the top 10, but the watch list is actually 20 countries. And these 20 countries that are highlighted in the report you can get the report at rescue.org, our website. The top 20 countries account for 90% of humanitarian need around the world. There are 340 million people, according to the UN, in humanitarian need. 90% of them live in these countries. 81% of the forcibly displaced around the world internally and externally as refugees and asylum seekers are in these countries. And 100% of the most food insecure, including those in famine status, IPC5, International Phase Classification 5, are in these countries. So it really frames the target, if the world is serious, about tackling extreme poverty. Why Somalia number one? Essentially, it is the epitome of conflict plus climate plus economic crisis. We see across the 20 countries that the three big drivers, the three big accelerators of humanitarian crisis Our first conflict, that explains 80% of the variation. Climate, the climate crisis, which is not tomorrow's problem, it's today's problem. And the particular dilemma or the particular duality that faces a country like Somalia is that it's very exposed to climate emergency. It's suffered five successive missed rains, and it's not well prepared for that climate emergency. So the second driver, the second accelerator is climate crisis. The third and this is a kicker this year, is the economic shocks arising in part from the end of COVID. We all know about inflation in Western countries. But the Ukraine war has not just been a disaster for people in Ukraine. It's also driven up food and energy prices around the world. And one of the interesting statistics, I think, in the report is that food price inflation in the 20 countries is 40%, so more than double what it is in the industrialized world. So you can see the ripple effects of the Ukraine crisis far away. I do want to get into that question about food price inflation, because as you noted, it is an accelerator of every other problem that many of these crises face, and it's layered on top of already dire humanitarian situations. Why is food price and food price inflation so much greater in those countries than it is in elsewhere around the world? Two parts of the explanation for that. One, local production is not sufficient. And there's a big debate going on among African leaders of how Africa can better feed itself. But in a country like Afghanistan, which depends on imports, the second factor is obviously transport costs. And this is the way in which energy prices feed through into food prices. The increased transportation costs drive up food prices. So you mentioned Somalia as your top country of concern. And I would note that I did an entire episode on a potential threat of famine in Somalia. And I encourage listeners to check that out. Ethiopia, you cited as your second crisis of concern. And I would imagine if I asked you a year ago, Ethiopia would probably be the top crisis considering how it was in the depths of the Tigray war, which now has subsided slightly. How concerned are you for Ethiopia in 2023? Well, interestingly enough, Ethiopia was joint top last year with Afghanistan. So you're making a very important point. One of the points we make in the report is that 
the 20 countries in the watch list receive less than 1% of media coverage. Yes, this is partly a Tigre question, but it's not only a Tigre question. 7 million people in Tigre, really very, very serious humanitarian situation. We remain dismayed by the situation there and urge that the full fulfillment of the peace agreements, commitments to the flow of humanitarian aid. But we, the International Rescue Committee, work across Ethiopia. And actually, our teams in Oromia, in Somali region, are actually larger than our teams in Tigray. And it's very, very important to say that the conflict and the climate and the economic dynamics are interacting in very dangerous ways elsewhere in the country as well, not just in the north, where obviously the role of Eritrea is also a significant part of the story. I'd also now like you to discuss the situation in Afghanistan. You mentioned last year it was the top concern for, I think, all of the obvious reasons, given the chaotic situation stemming from the U.S. withdrawal. One year now on from Taliban rule, how do you expect the humanitarian situation to evolve in Afghanistan in 2023? Well, it's in steady state, but it's in a very bad steady state. And I really appreciate the chance to say a little bit about this, because essentially what's happened in the 15, 16 months since the end of Western military operations at the end of August 2021, the promise that was made by Western countries, which was that they would leave militarily, but stay politically, economically, humanitarian, aid-wise, has not been fulfilled. And the war economy is over, but the new economy hasn't been built. So the country, and more importantly, its people, are bumping along at the absolute economic rock bottom. And people often then say, well, what are you able to do there? And I say quite a lot. It's absolutely staggering to me that we now have more than 7,500 staff in Afghanistan, 99% of them Afghans, 40% of them female, women Afghans. And we are expanding our services because it's much safer than it was a couple of years ago. Of course, it's a difficult operating environment, but our staff say to me again and again, please get the message out. We didn't choose our government, so don't penalize us for our government. And that means that the international financial institutions, the US government, which has created an Afghan fund for the released, previously frozen, now released assets that are needed to underpin the banking system, the economy needs a revival until it gets one. And that's going to have to be internally and regionally generated because historically Afghanistan has had a a strong trading element to its economy. Until then, we're going to need more aid. And Martin Griffiths, the UN head of the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, has made the point that if you don't get the economy going, the aid budget is going to mushroom. And that's what's happening at the moment, except the aid need is mushrooming, but the aid pledges are not. And that's why the country and its people remain at risk, at such grave risk. I mean, do you see any near-term opportunities for countries to commercially engage with Afghanistan in ways that might broadly lift the economy and reduce the humanitarian needs? Well, I'm not an expert on the Afghan economy, but what I know is that there are 38 million people there. There are businesses whose assets were frozen in August 2021 who are not able to get their assets moving. I know that the region, Pakistan to the east, Central Asia to the north, Iran to the west, there is a thriving regional trade. China, some people like this, other people don't like this. China is very engaged in Afghanistan. And there is obviously an illicit part of the economy, which is the drug economy, which is booming, which is not the type of economic activity that you want. So I think that It's not a matter of, I think you asked about foreign investors. You're not going to get major car companies going to build car plants in uh, Afghanistan. But there is a regional trade that Afghanistan should be part of. And its own businesses need to be able to supply not just themselves, but supply the region. So number four on your watch list is the Democratic Republic of Congo. Presumably, it is so high on the list because of a resurgence of conflict linked in part to the once thought dormant M23 rebel group. How might the humanitarian needs unfold for DRC in 2023? 
and what is accelerating the humanitarian crisis in Eastern DRC right now? Essentially, this is a conflict story, but it's a conflict story that is symptomatic of the kind of civil wars, so-called civil wars, they're very uncivil in all sorts of ways, the internal conflicts that are going on around the world at the moment. I, I say that because there are 54 civil conflicts going on around the world at the moment. The one in DRC is, is, is emblematic or symptomatic for a number of reasons. One, it's multifaceted. Two, it's happening in a number of parts of Eastern DRC. We make the point in the report that the number of countries with more than two conflicts is mushrooming. I think about 16 countries now in that group, and DRC certainly fits that. Thirdly, there are a very complicated set of players, both internal and external. And so when I say that 80% of humanitarian need around the world, or when the report says that 80% of humanitarian need around the world is driven by conflict, DRC is a prime example. You then ask, well, what will decide the course of humanitarian need in DRC next year? It's going to be the course of the conflicts, plural. And maybe we should refer to it as a civil conflicts situation, not just a civil conflict situation. The economics that doesn't help, the climate doesn't help. This is fundamentally a conflict story. Any conflict story is also a displacement story. So there's a big internal displacement aspect to this. And I'm afraid the prospects are dark. DRC has gone up our list compared to last year. Lastly, I wanted to ask you about Yemen. As we speak, there is a fragile ceasefire holding. Though that ceasefire formally expired, there hasn't been a full-scale resumption of conflict in Yemen, yet the humanitarian needs are seemingly still compounding. What do you expect for Yemen in 2023, and why is it number five on your list this year? Well, this is a very interesting one, because we actually highlight Yemen in two ways in the report. One, you're absolutely right, it's number five on the list. But we also give a, an example, the theme of the report is about when crisis hits, you need guardrails to prevent catastrophe. And we cite Yemen as one of three examples of unusual in 2022, when the guardrails were strengthened. How were they strengthened? They were strengthened by the ceasefire agreement that you refer to from the spring of this year. It officially ran out in October, but it's still being more or less abided by. But the country isn't going to rebound until there's a longer term stability and confidence. And the truth is that Yemen faces a real fork. I mean, there are two different Yemens for 2023. One is a return to conflict which will be a disaster for north, south, east, and west for all parts of the country. And the other is that the country's ceasefire is turned into a peace agreement, and there is the beginnings of a more normal political, economic, social set of relationships. I think that it's very, very important to emphasize that the strengthening of guardrails, stronger social safety nets, more effective diplomacy, proper respect for civilians by combatants in conflict, more effective and more humanitarian aid. All those guardrails are a matter of choice. And the wrong choices were made in the main in 2022. Yemen was a bit of an outlier because it was actually a successful negotiation that Hans Grunberg, the UN special envoy, managed to work on. And so I think it's really important that people don't take their eyes off Yemen because a bit like Afghanistan, it, it, it's very much down at rock bottom. And the malnutrition risk, the, the famine risk is real in Yemen today. I think listeners might be interested and curious that Ukraine landed number 10 on the report and not say number one. What explains Ukraine's position on the watch list? Well, the simple answer is that the international funding, humanitarian and refugee response in Ukraine has been very good. The Ukraine appeal for humanitarian aid inside Ukraine is fully funded. And the European Union has guaranteed refugees from Ukraine three years worth of work, residency, schooling for kids, etc. And so the guardrails have been strengthened in Ukraine. I think that's a good thing. We shouldn't be robbing Peter to pay Paul. We should be saying that other countries should be as well protected as well supported. So Ukraine's position is explained by the strengthening of the guardrails. Why is Ukraine still on the list? Because Frankly, the Russian army is pummeling the civilian infrastructure and threatening to destroy the ability to heat people's homes through the winter. And so there's a major risk of a mass 
exodus as energy supplies are, are blocked from vital public and private buildings. Having been in the humanitarian space for so long, to what extent do you believe that race plays a factor in the reason that the Ukraine crisis is so well funded compared to other crises, particularly in Africa? Well, I think that the European response in respect of Ukraine is better explained by geography. I mean, this is the largest war. It's not, it's not the first war on the European continent since the Second World War, but it's the largest war on the European continent. It's the largest refugee flow. It's landed in every European country. It's, in that sense, crashed through the windows into the living rooms of every house in Europe. And so I think geography is the big explanation. Geopolitics obviously explains the U.S. military response, but geography explains the humanitarian stroke refugee response. So the Yemen ceasefire is one trend you cite as something positive headed into 2023. Are there other positive trends you could cite that might take it together, mitigate some of the catastrophes that we might expect for the rest of 2023? Effective diplomacy, proper adaptive climate resilience. We give the example of Bangladesh and the climate adaptation against the cyclones. Could you elaborate on that? Because that's an interesting example in which I believe the World Bank and other international institutions supported local Bangladeshi efforts to basically have like emergency shelters for people who are in the way of cyclones. Yes, I think it is interesting. I mean, the overall story is that 2022 was quite a significant year for commitments to climate mitigation. China, the US, EU now have major commitments in that area, not the product of the UN climate conference, the product of national decisions in those countries. But the climate adaptation story remains very, very weak. I mean, the $100 billion a year fund that was promised in 2009 is not yet rolling. And the poorest countries in the world have almost no allocation for adaptation to climate change. The Bangladesh story is a very interesting one. The world knows about cyclones and the way they hit Bangladesh. It knows the damage that they wreak. And it does have the civil engineering and other sheltering capacity and experience to know how to protect people. 24 people did die in the cyclones in 2022, but the investment in precisely the shelters and the buildings that you talk about meant that there weren't the thousands of deaths that would have been expected. So it's very important that your listeners know that the IRC is a solutions-focused NGO. We, we don't go and parade the suffering. We parade what can be done about it. That's what we want to build on. We set out three parts to the agenda of how to think about a solutions orientation. One is to intervene to break cycles of crisis, for example, to stop food insecurity becoming famine. Second, to protect civilians in conflict, for example, by setting up an office for the promotion of humanitarian access, which could speak independently, because I think that we think that NGOs and, frankly, UN officials are in a very compromised position when it comes to speaking out against governments who are hosting them. So we need independent call out of those governments and non-state actors who are denying access to aid. And thirdly, more effective management of global public goods, notably around health pandemic planning, but also dealing with the climate crisis. Are there any concrete steps that key governments or institutions around the world could take to prevent any of the top crises that we discussed from metastasizing through 2023, in the near term, in the next few weeks or a few months, what specifically could governments or institutions do? I mean, look, the most severe crisis, we can't cover everything, but let's deal with the most severe crisis, which is a threat of famine in East Africa, also to some extent in Northeast Nigeria, in Yemen, and in Afghanistan. One, it's worse than a moral stain that famine appeals are underfunded. And the truth is that only the US is basically stumping up for the threat of famine in East Africa. I'm a Brit who lives in America, so I'm not championing my own government. But the Biden administration and the Congress that has voted the funds, the USA is delivering 80% of the funds, international funds going into Somalia. Where is the EU? Where is the UK? Where is the Gulf? They're nowhere. And that should be a source of real shame. So one, funding. Two, the UN does have a high-level panel on 
preventing famine. And the clue is in the name, preventing famine. But it's not able to do that because it's it's a general task force. It's not got specific locus. We need to repurpose that high-level task force so it has the right international bodies on it, not just UN agencies. It needs financial institutions. It needs donors. It also needs the national and local governments from the countries at risk of famine. So we need institutional reform. Third, we need to bridge the climate humanitarian divide. At the moment, one of the major reasons why there's a threat of famine in East Africa is mist rains. The mist rains are putting an impossible strain on subsistence and other agriculture. So we need investment, not just in risk mapping, but in innovation in climate resilient agriculture. We, the IRC, are doing some interesting work in northeast Syria on strengthening of seeds, seed strengthening. So there's no excuse that we don't know what could be done. You asked about today or tomorrow. Those things can be done. Those governments and non-state actors that are preventing aid reaching communities in humanitarian distress, they need to be called out. That's why we say there should be an independent panel for the promotion of humanitarian access. The preparation for the next pandemic, there's no excuse that three years into the COVID pandemic, we don't yet have a global leaders forum, a political forum on pandemic preparation and response. So we have plenty of ideas in our watch list about what could be done. What we're calling on is political will to do them. David, thank you so much for your time. I think the sirens in the background provide a suitable backdrop (laughs) for our conversation. It's an emergency. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening to Global Dispatches. Our show is produced by me, Mark Leon Goldberg, and edited and mixed by Levi Sharp. If you have questions or comments, please email us using the contact button on globaldispatchespodcast.com. Before you go, do take a moment to show your support for the show by becoming a premium subscriber. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, you can do so with a couple taps of your thumb. If you're listening elsewhere, you can go to patreon.com slash globaldispatches. We rely on support from listeners to continue to do what we do far into the future. And by becoming a premium subscriber, you will unlock access to our entire archive of hundreds and hundreds of episodes. Please rate or review the show on Apple Podcasts.